All right, thanks to everyone that's joining us. Congressman, we're live. Well, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. We're so delighted that you can join us for another book and author event uh, tonight with Rick Perlstein, author of Reaganland, and uh, of course, our, uh, our usual moderator, Chris uh, Reback. Let me just uh, do some acknowledgements uh, and then just uh, we'll give you a little bit of information about the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at Cornell and uh, then introduce our special guests. I do want to acknowledge several uh, former members of Congress uh, who are with us this evening. Uh, Congressman Gary Ackerman, a Democrat from New York. Congressman Tom Coleman, a Republican from Missouri. Congressman Martin Frost, a Democrat from Texas. Congressman Bill Enyart, a Democrat from Illinois. And Congressman Jack Kingston, a Republican from Georgia. We're also joined by Lori and Marty Scheinman. Uh, Marty sits uh, on the board of directors of the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at Cornell. Quick word about our institute. Uh, we have a very uh, critical and, and core mission, and that is to cultivate the next generation of public servants by curating uh, political programs that deepen discourse and raise understanding. Our guests have included Nancy Pelosi just weeks after she became the Speaker of the House. We are relentlessly bipartisan. Uh, and so we also had Reince Priebus, who is, of course, President Trump's former chief of staff. We uh, have had uh, prominent senators, members of the House, diplomats, authors, and others. Uh, just so you know, we have some, several really interesting programs coming up. Uh, our next program, uh, next Wednesday at 1 p.m., is Anatomy of an Ad. And what we've done is we've selected the, one of the best media consultants on the Democratic side and one of the best media consultants on the Republican side. And they're going to break down for you uh, how ads are made, produced, composed, uh, how they uh, attempt to move you uh, in one direction or the other. That's next Wednesday at 1 p.m., Anatomy of an Ad. Uh, and then uh, we have coming up Jeffrey Tubin uh, of The New Yorker and a legal analyst for CNN. He's going to expand on a recent essay he had in The New Yorker uh, examining the, the likely legal fights and perhaps endless litigation that our country may be facing uh, after uh, this election is over, uh, starting perhaps on election night. Uh, on that topic, I, I want to conclude by uh, announcing that uh, we are about to launch something called the Campaign for Democracy. The Campaign for Democracy is a bipartisan coalition, Republicans and Democrats, members of Congress, former members of Congress, political consultants, pollsters, focus group conveners, and others. And we're going to work together uh, to build a campaign that restores people's faith in democracy uh, and also uh, fights attempts to subvert democratic norms. You'll be hearing more about that later for information. Just Google Cornell Institute of Politics and Global Affairs, or you, know, you can go directly to our website at iopga.cornell.edu. Our guest tonight, Rick Perlstein. Uh, he is the author of four books that have tracked the rise of conservatism in America. His first book, The Invisible Bridge, The Fall of Nixon and the Rise of Reagan, New York Times bestseller. Second book, Nixonland, The Rise of a President and the Fracturing of America, New York Times bestseller. Uh, third book, Before the Storm, Barry Goldwater and the Unmaking of the American Consensus, selected as one of the best books of the year by the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, and others. Um, here's how the New York Times described Reaganland, America's right turn. Uh, in, in a just effusive, uh, the, the uh, review was just effusive in its praise, but here's the, the sentence that uh, stood out for me and I think captures the essence of the book. The New York Times said, quote, the joy of this book and the reason it remains fresh for nearly a thousand pages is that personality and character constantly confound the conventional wisdom. And having read this book, I couldn't agree more. Rick is going to be in discussion uh, with uh, our own uh, Chris Reback. Uh, Chris uh, is the uh, host Chris Reback's Conversations. He publishes Chris Reback's newsletter, which is a daily email that helps you stay smarter and cuts through the noise and connects the ideas and news to help you make sense of what the heck is happening in the world. You can sign up at chrisreback.com. He's also the founder of Good Guys Media Ventures and a host of podcasts on politics, business, technology, science, education, and the arts. Uh, his Political Wire Conversations uh, was ranked number three on iTunes News and Politics category. And some of his previous stops include uh, 60 Minutes, ABC News, uh, Overseas Work in Central and Western Europe, 
Uh, he's also the co-author of the excellent book, You Won, Now What? How Americans Can Make Democracy Work from City Hall to the White House. Ladies and gentlemen, and my former colleagues in Congress, you are in for a treat. Chris, let's go to you. Thank you, Steve, very much. Uh, it's, it's a bit, uh, feels a bit awkward to have uh, a book called, one's own book called Excellent when we're talking with Rick Perlstein, who has now you know, done it, as you just noted, for the fourth time. So whatever, Rick. I mean, your books are good. I want to be honest. I mean, they're good. You do good work, but um, you know, excellence a high bar. So um, we're going to try to get you, though. You know, we'll get you New York Times bestseller one more time. How about that? Thank you for joining. Um, uh, so, Rick, I, I know you're a historian. That's how you um, uh, identify yourself uh, at the at the top, even before an author. And among the reasons I love history so much is um, less that it, not so much what it tells us about yesterday, but how it helps us understand today. And I need some help understanding today. So there's this picture, you may recognize it. And this is, this is not meant to be a shameless plug. Well, I mean, yes, it is a shameless plug, but I, I'm wanting you, you know, the audience to see uh, Reagan and Jimmy Carter sitting in the limousine, smiling on their way to the inauguration in 1981. Uh, I know you know, yesterday and again today, the current American president refused to uh, confirm that he would abide by a peaceful transfer of power. Um, Rick, would we see a picture like this again this year, should uh, Biden win? Well, <laughs> I sure hope so. Uh, we talk about bipartisanship as an ideal. I don't know how easy it's going to be to uphold the ideal of bipartisanship if Republicans revealed themselves as collaborators with dictatorship. Why would we want to sit on panels with people who do that, right? Um, this is uh, a very portentous time in uh, the American experiment in democracy and Republican government. And uh, as much as Ronald Reagan was a profoundly controversial figure, uh, I, I can't imagine him ever dreaming of uh, contesting the results of the Electoral College or speaking to congressional uh, you know, legislative delegations in states controlled by Republicans and uh, signaling that they should be sending uh, electors uh, to Washington in January of 2021 and advising them to vote against the candidate who won the most votes in their states. Would he recognize his party? Yes, very much so. Uh, history is the study of continuity and change. And uh, there's a great deal uh, in Donald Trump that you can recognize in Ronald Reagan. Certainly when you know, uh, Donald Trump you know, stands up in front of the National Archives and says, you know, teaching Americans, school children, that uh, racism is a structural feature of American life is somehow illegitimate, I really hear the echoes of Ronald Reagan, whose uh, most um, comforting appeal to white America was that they were not racist, that America was not a racist country, uh, sometimes he did it in ways that, you know, were rooted in at least legitimate facts. Like, for example, he would mention that Los Angeles elected, you know, an African-American mayor in 1973. Sometimes he would root them in fantasy. Like he would say that um, when he was a baseball announcer in Iowa in the 1930s, he was one of the announcers who called for the um, integration of the major leagues and lo and behold it happened but you know it didn't happen until like you know what 15 years after he stopped being an announcer 11 years after he stopped being an announcer or he'd say um the army was integrated you know after um uh cook you know on pearl harbor you know manned the guns you know and fought, uh you know shot down you know japanese fighters right uh another uh goal of the book was to make it impossible to uh, wonder why um, members of the evangelical right uh, could endorse someone like Donald Trump. As I document, uh, a huge part of uh, the evangelical movement's turn to politics in the late 1970s 
was rooted in basically a conspiracy theory that has very strong resemblances to QAnon. It was the idea that gay men uh, could not reproduce, so they were recruiting children. Uh, one of the most uh, powerful Christian right preachers was a guy named James Robeson, still close to the Bush family, who uh, in 1979 got kicked off his affiliate in Fort Worth for saying that gays were recruiting boys and murdering them. And when he was kicked off the air, he became a martyr. And that martyrdom led to a rally of 10,000 people you know, in Dallas and you know, fighting for his right to say that sort of thing on the air. And that was one of the galvanizing, catalyzing movements that led to the foundation of the moral majority, uh, which was an absolutely crucial part of Reagan's coalition. So even though Ronald Reagan was a guy who, for example, revered immigrants, right? George Bush and Ronald Reagan, uh, who were the last men standing in the Republican nomination fight in 1980, um, in Texas, in the primary, competed with each other to say the nicest things about not only immigrants from Mexico, but undocumented immigrants from Mexico. Uh, and so that's obviously a great contrast. Um, but you cannot understand what's happening now in the Republican Party without uh, understanding the coalition that brought Ronald Reagan to power. So, so talk to me about that, because I, I, I think that um, understanding today it, it's, is, is among the many ways that your book and your books are just so helpful. Um, you, you just said, you know, you, you hear things and, and think about things uh, from Reagan. And, you know, when you see them in Trump, there, there are connections. There are so many connections as well. Um, some of the things that you've written about, about Nixon. Mm -hmm. um, that that come back and you yeah. you know we know in, including a number of the people who worked uh, back then you know named, you know most obviously Roger Stone. Um, but, Wait, but, Roger Stone is still around. <laughs> what happened? To that I, guy? I, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. He's he's someplace. He, he uh, uh, yeah, he's he's someplace. Might be getting a tattoo or something. I don't know where he is right now. But but your your books are. Yes, about the personalities. Yes, they are about Reagan. Yes, they are about Nixon. But they are a roadmap to of, of American conservatism. Um, they're, they're widely considered and, and often described as the roadmap of um, how conservatism took control uh, of of American political power. Um, does conservatism still exist today? Is it the same conservatism? How to trace that path? Um, you, you, know, you, you spend your books tracing a path from Goldwater through Reagan. You know, when I was talking to people about this book and about the conversation with you, what most folks want to understand is, well, how in the heck did we get from there, though, to here? Right. Um, there's, an, a very, there's a very important difference uh, in the conservatism of Ronald Reagan's day and the conservatism of Donald Trump's day but it's rooted in a underlying homology, a very important similarity. Uh, so I've been you know, reading you know, the documents during this 23 years of research of you know, what conservatives you know, say to each other, right? When no one else is looking. And an enormous part of what conservatism's rise to power has been about is um, the idea of um, creating a message that, you know, has attractive optics uh, for ideas that aren't necessarily all that popular uh, when exposed to the light of day. For example, the idea of you know of cutting taxes for the wealthy that's never been popular. It isn't popular. So how did they manage to you know get it done, right? And there's a whole lot of subterfuge. You know that you can sort of you can kind of read the playbook in these books that I write uh, to give uh, an important example. Um, you know, Ronald Reagan um, would sign letters written by staffers. Uh, I don't think I'm giving away any secrets, Congressman, when I say that occasionally politicians do that. Uh, and he would dictate letters to his secretary that were to his friends and his colleagues and to his critics. And uh, if you compare the two transcripts, the two bodies of evidence, you're looking at two very different Ronald Reagans, right? The Ronald Reagan who signed the letters was the guy who wrote to like a liberal New York Times columnist like Anthony Lewis and presented himself as an intellectual in the broad center of, you know, establishment opinion, right? He write, wrote to authors, uh, you know, he'd, 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 he'd uh, write to an author who sent him a book, but the cover note to him might say, governor, 
uh, here's a letter for you to sign. Uh, and the letter says, what a wonderful book. And then the cover note says, don't bother to read the book, right? Uh, and uh, at the same time, the letters that he's dictating are saying, I wonder what, uh, what's going on in the Middle East, uh, what its relationship is to prophecy in the book of Revelation, right? Or he would say, I'm not trying to change my ideology from anyone, for anyone. The same day in which he'd receive a briefing about how to answer questions about his opinion on cell two, you know, to basically uh, make it look like he was, you know, in the broad center of American opinion. Uh, and a huge part of uh, the political work of the people around Ronald Reagan was kind of disciplining the stuff that he actually believed. You know, he'd give a speech, in, you know, to you know, on the, the on the mashed potato circuit, and then he'd have a question and answer circuit. Uh, he'd have a question and answer session, and he would say, um, "It's come to my attention that the Soviet Union uh, has dispersed 20 million young people to the countryside." in order to practice reassembling the society in the event of a nuclear war. And they've dispersed their industry underground, right? And it would show up in the newspapers the next day. And then suddenly, you know, Mike Deaver would have a job on his hands explaining, oh, well, he must have been misquoted or misunderstood. That's a metaphor for a lot of what the, the conservative movement uh, has been about. And the profound transformation that Donald Trump represents is he kind of lowers that scrim between the public and the private transcript, right? Um, there's, there's always uh, um, a challenge uh, in uh, a conservative movement uh, rising to power when, you know, so many of their policies are not in the interests of, you know, the broad masses of citizens in a democracy. So I would say that the biggest difference and the biggest um, important thing to understand uh, in reading these books that I've written is um, how uh, the dog whistle, right? Which is, you know, say Richard Nixon saying the first civil rights of all, right of all Americans is to be free from domestic violence, right? The dog whistle in that case is, well, those people say they're for civil rights, really we're for civil rights. Or Richard Nixon saying, I'm speaking for the great silent majority of Americans who don't really go into the streets and protest, right? Well, when you have a majority, you have a minority. You know, everyone knows what minorities are in America. So the train whistle. Donald Trump saying, you know, they're sending their rapists. Donald Trump saying, forgive me, they're coming from shithole countries, right? Um, but deep down, a lot of the um, policy goals are the same. There's a very long tradition in political, uh, in conservative political life of these sort of documents about their kind of long-term plans, right? The Discovery Institute in Seattle, which is pushing, has pushed creationism, having a 30-year plan, how we're gonna manage to, you know, get people to doubt uh, uh, the, uh, the, the theory of evolution, you know, um, the Cato Institute talking about their Leninist strategy to undo social security. And, and so is and one of the, if I could say one more thing, Chris, yeah. one of the striking things about the conservative movement now in, 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 in uh, the form of its, you know, public officials, right? Not, not just their kind of people who are writing memos for each other, is the extent to which they've kind of um, welcomed this opportunity to kind of pull down the curtain uh, and instead of uh, reacting in horror, saying, wow, isn't it great, you know, that we don't have to pretend anymore. Well, well and so many people, you are among them, you've, you have written that, you know, that this is not a normal election. Um, right. You have, you know, been been somewhat public about your concern about where we are. You are not alone. There are many, many Americans who are uh, just a bit concerned that liberal uh, small L democracy is under threat. And so, is what you're describing is this the logical conclusion of pulling down the curtain? Is this the true? conservatism that you have documented over the years and now it's just you know full frontal and we're seeing everything and there's no hiding or is what we're seeing today a perversion of what you've covered and documented you know from Goldwater you know and beyond right Chris you know literally I can't answer that right other people ask those questions are the 90 percent of Republicans who support Donald Trump you know, something like the, you know, 80 or 90% of self-described conservatives who support Donald Trump, you know, uh, do you support X, Y, Z is something to ask them. What does it mean for uh, um, 
you know, uh, an ideology uh, that has made representations of its beliefs over uh, decades to suddenly, you know, reverse those representations when, you know, they're coming into a situation where they feel like they can exert permanent power over the three branches of the government of the United States. So, you know, I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear a member of uh, the Republican caucus in Congress to answer that question. That's for them. That's not for me. Let's talk about the uh, evangelicals um, a bit. You, you, you there, there's so many aspects of the book that, um, you know, that, that one can ask you about. Um, voter restriction and the way that that came up. Um, I mean, 77. Yeah. yeah, I, I mean, it, you know, and, and we'll talk, maybe we'll talk about that in a second, but, but Reagan's quote about you can't trust, he was talking about voter registration by mail, but I, I read that part and it, it just, it rings exactly, you know, very similar. To saying, why don't we try reverse psychology? Why don't we try making it harder to vote? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That it was a great line and, and, a, and, you know, what, a, what a, what a terrific, what a terrific thought. That's the centerpiece of democracy is to restrict voting, of course. Um, but on the evangelicals that you raised a moment ago, um, obviously you document the, the, and I think it's almost the formation of that relationship. And it did kind of, it, you know, my understanding from, from your writings that really did kind of start around uh, the, the, you know, during the ERA time, the, the kind of integration of the rise of the ERA as it was reaching or about to reach that 38 state threshold, and then the rise of the anti-gay movement and Anita Bryant and everything that was going on in, in Florida. Um, and many people, at least before uh, RBG died and the reality of what a six to three majority could do to Roe versus Wade and other social issues hit, many people you know, still wondered why evangelicals would be so connected with Trump today and everything that, that exists in his personal life. Um, but in your discussion on how ERA opponents built that opposition, um, you, and, and, and how it looked, you know, just as it looked like that amendment that the ERA was, was going to pass, um, you wrote that the, the most common answer cited by 56% it is among the evangelicals, was that the ERA was against God's plan for the family. The second most common answer was that it would, quote, it would encourage an unbiblical relationship between men and women. And for evangelicals to call something unbiblical or against God's plan was no minor thing, you write. It was not a matter of live and let live. You handle your family in your way. I'll handle my family and mine. The central evangelical tenant, the reason they evangelized was the great commission in Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Fighting that which was unbiblical was more even than a matter of life and death. It was a matter of eternal life and death. I read that and I'm thinking about, it, I'm, I'm thinking about the language that's being used today and the battles that are going on. Has, has that insight of yours from the 1970s changed a lick in the last 50 years? Well, I mean, if you're an evangelical Christian, do, they, do you still believe that, you know, last things that your, you know, mission here on earth is to bring, you know, bring God's kingdom? I mean, the, um, the woman that Donald Trump appears prepared to nominate to the Supreme Court said her work in the judiciary is to build God's kingdom on earth. So, you know, clearly that's um, still the case. People are not going to, you know, give up their, uh, you know, foundational constitutional sense of how the world works and man's place in it just because for any reason, really. That, that story you tell is a, is, is a fascinating one. Mm -hmm. It also speaks to the hubris of liberals. Uh, I, I quote Time Magazine, you know, and yes. every year they have their man of the year, right? And in 1976, in recognition of um, what appears to be, you know, the imminent success of the Equal Rights Amendment and feminism as almost like the hegemonic ideology of everyone in America, they, they name women of the year. And I have this quote in the book that I was, you know, struggling to find. I wasn't able to, to, to page through and find it, but it is, it's something like uh, in 1976, the women's drive has gone beyond ideology to be a universal belief. 
And I point out that at the same time as they were saying that, um, these kind of popular evangelical advice books for women, therapeutic books, uh, were books, um, the quotes from those books were just extraordinary. Should we? Should we? Should we? Um, should we uh, find one? Uh, if you can find one, yeah. If if, if memory serves, I'm going to guess that it was around page. Uh, I got it. Ish. <laughs> I got it. You know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, when you don't write thousand page books without being able to find information really, really fast. <laughs> um, uh, uh, let's see. Um, there were the books and lectures. Uh, oh, no, that's not that one. Uh, uh, unfortunately, yeah, here we go. Yeah, here we go. In the Gift of Inner Healing, actually. Um, that was a book written by uh, Jimmy Carter's sister, Ruth Carter Stapleton. Stapleton. She counseled a women desperately unhappy in their marriage, quote, try to spend a little time each day visualizing Jesus coming in the door from work. Then see yourself walking up to him, embracing him. Say to Jesus, it's good to have you home, Nick. Uh, here's um, The Spirit Controlled Women by uh, Beverly LaHaye, who was... Um, the wife of Tim LaHaye, who wrote the Left Behind novels. The woman who is truly spirit-filled will want to want to be totally submissive to her husband. This is a truly liberated woman. As the woman, the woman humbles herself, dies to self, uh, and submits to her husband, she begins to find herself within that relationship. A servant in, is one who gets excited about making somebody else successful. You can live fully by dying to yourself and submitting to your husband. Now, these are not obscure books. These are books that are selling 5 million copies, right? Uh, and these are the books being read by the people who uh, are fighting the equal rights movement, not just as a matter of politics, but as you say, as a matter of last things, as a, as a matter of the, the, the survival of civilization. And, you know, it speaks to, um, yes, I think the, the strange and fundamentally undemocratic nature of a lot of this fundamental Christianity, but at the same time, how could Time Magazine be so oblivious to the nation that they're, um, that they're uh, uh, asserting themselves as the um, voice of to not grasp this, right? And one of the dramas of my books, one of the, uh, is to record that irony happening over and over and over again. You know, 1964, you know, Barry Goldwater uh, loses California by a million votes. And there's a headline in the New York Times, white backlash does not uh, develop. Right, of course, Barry Goldwater voted against the Civil Rights Act, and the fact that he lost was taken as vindication of, the, of America's support of civil rights. Well, that same day in California, by almost exactly the same deficit, uh, a open housing bill passes, uh, I mean, fails, initiative, I should say. So basically, the same people who are voting for Lyndon Johnson are voting for the right uh, not to live next to an African-American, right? But over well, and over again, conservatism is declared dead and buried, and it always somehow manages like the Godzilla and you know the last the you know the, the sequel rises from the from below and and bodies forth, and uh, here we are. Well, well, it, that is just w one of the elements of art that um, is just a signature of your writing to you know take the reader along. What's happening on the front pages? What's happening? in, in you know, the, on, on the evening news. You did it in Nixon land at the beginning, your whole treatment of the Watts riots. When, right. And, you know, that that was dominating uh, all of the coverage while, you know, the, the law and order um, sentiment was, was kind five, of- Five days after Lyndon Johnson stands under the Capitol Dome, Capitol Dome with Martin Luther King, signs the, uh, the Voting Rights Act, and almost literally declares racism dead in America. He says, you know, the slaves came here in, in, in bondage. We have, in chains, we have broken the last vestiges of those fierce and ancient bonds, right? Yes. Barack and, Obama is elected. And uh, a little book called Nixonland comes out. And the last line of the book is that William, Americans are, 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 is Nixonland over? No, it's not over yet. And I talk about Americans fantasizing about killing each other in cold blood. Um, People say, wow, that's a great book, but what the heck is he talking about at the end? And literally some of the people who wrote that in the reviews apologized to me, yeah. uh, realizing that that's part of the American patrimony, that kind of mutual recrimination and rage towards different tribes of Americans. And here we are. And the, the, that, that rage, that retribution, and that the everyday um, inability and, and I mean, we all we all have it. I, I ha we all have it of of looking beyond um, just what we are being shown or just what we are choosing to see. I mean, the, the most you know, one of the recent examples I would argue 
was 2016. And so many of us uh, felt that um, that one of the problem, you know, one of the things that the Democratic Party didn't realize was what was going on in the Midwest, what was going on in, in white working class America of what they had had lost. There are Some also- of us not realizing it. I remember my, my favorite Saturday Night Live skit of the last 20 years is all these, uh, you know, nice middle class white folks sitting on a couch watching the election, election reviews aghast returns aghast that so many of their fellow Americans could be so racist and, and, and two black guys in the back kind of smirking. <laughs> Where have these guys been living the last 400 years? Yeah, yes, yeah. So that, that's, I'll drink, you know, I gotta, I gotta have a little, um, I gotta have a little of uh, the grape after these happy, uh, happy uh, reflections. Uh, terrific. I, I wish that we were doing this in person because I would ask you to refill my glass. I, you know, you should have given me the heads up. I would have, I would have joined you. You know, I, I, you know, I guess luckily I can, you're doing. I can vamp while you go to the kitchen. Chris. <laughs> That's the great yeah, thing about you. Know, I'm, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you can. Um, <laughs> let's talk as well about uh, another element. I think, of, I think uh, in, in Steve's uh, line of work, they call it a filibuster. Exactly. <laughs> Although that's the Senate. Yeah. Maybe yeah. someday. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's why you're hoping they don't do away with the filibuster, right? So that you can. Uh, you have don't the, have, they don't have the talking filibusters anymore. <laughs> There's lots of filibusters in the book, by the way. They filibuster a labor law reform that has buy-in from both corporate America and labor. And uh, suddenly at the last minute, uh, a bunch of executives of Fortune 500 companies are like, wow, there's way too much liberalism happening. We got to filibuster this thing to death. And a young senator, freshman senator from this new right movement, Orrin Hatch, yeah. is the field general. It's a lot like he's a lot like the Freedom Caucus guys uh, because he didn't uh, exercise the rules of deference that senators were supposed to reveal in their first uh, first year. What what is an Orrin Hatch, Rick? <laughs> That's uh, one of the one of the funniest thing, parts in the book. I hope uh, after Orrin Hatch, you know, wins this uh, come from behind behind victory, he's a nobody. He has no connections in Utah, and he wins the Senate race. And the, as 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 you know, once again, you know, the pundits are declaring conservatism dead because Jimmy Carter won. Um, the only article I could find that, that discussed Orrin Hatch's election in any depth was a humor piece about a suburban couple having a cocktail party and decide to make their theme Orrin Hatch because they thought the name was so funny. What's an Orrin Hatch? That's the name of the chapter. Yeah, yeah. The, the treatment, I mean, that whole, that whole part of the book and, and the, you know, the, the connection and obviously the, the Reagan connection. And that was also kind of a, a canary in a coal mine um, example where what was happening um, with him in Utah, and you, you explained it in other places. Yeah, I have a fun thing I stuck in way at the last minute, right before it went to the printers almost. Yeah. I added a paragraph about uh, an initiative that was on the ballot with Orrin Hatch in 1976 to uh, ban the fluoridation of water in yes. Utah. Yeah. And the well, rhetoric you, is you exactly you the same as COVID masks. It's what, who, are these, who are these pointy-headed scientists that tell me what to drink? Uh, that, sincerely, that was not going to be it. Did you put it in because of COVID? I can't believe that was not going to be in the book, that part. You know, it's a thousand pages long, Chris. I did a lot of cutting. You know, I did a, I did a New York Times op-ed well, based on Gerald Ford uh, having the whole nation take this uh, vaccine that was rushed into production for the swine flu. The swine flu never developed, but, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people were paralyzed by the vaccine. And that's what happens when you obviously rush the process of creating a vaccine. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to fact check you on the fly, man. a cutting room floor. Okay, that, that may be. And I don't want to, you know, fact check you on the fly. But, yeah. you know, it, it's a thousand page book, man. You, you didn't do that much cutting. <laughs> My wife just giggled in the background. Did you hear that? Uh, I, I, I heard that. I'm glad. I'm glad the acknowledgments. We... If it wasn't for her, it would have been 2000. Uh, very good. And, and you, you, uh, you, you write very lovingly about her in the acknowledgments. And uh, I, I guess you guys now have time for, what did you call it? Mad music? Something music. Mad music you're going to do now? Well, that's the... just between me and Judy. Okay. Well, you put it in the acknowledgments. It's not just between you guys anymore. <laughs> I'm just not remembering the exact phrase that you said, but it was something, it was an MM, something. Manic music. Say it, manic music. The manic music of her red pen. (laughs) Yeah, okay. I I knew knew that I was close. I'm not sure she read that. I don't know. You might be hearing that for the first time. (laughs) Um, I want to ask you another part about the book um, specifically, because we've been talking about 
um, the path of conservatism. How did we get here today? You, you know, would Ronald Reagan recognize the, the party now? Um, and I, I want to we, we I want to leave room because there are questions from the audience, and um, uh, Congressman Israel uh, ha has at least one question for you as well. But you you write among the many many things that you do that is just make your books just so much fun um, to read is bringing to, to life characters who um, some of us should have known about, but um, I will confess I didn't. I didn't know Richard Vigory. Hmm. So, um, I, you know, I just, I wasn't fully right. you know, aware. Pat Cadell, I knew. Um, you know, Vigory, I didn't know. And wow, what a, what a character. Um, and, and he almost, I, it's probably an exaggeration to say he invented the connection of direct mail to the political process, but he certainly was one of the drivers of it. And, and the, the powerful line to me about it, and just to be clear, he raised a bunch of money, did, there are all sorts of things that he did, but- Scared the bejesus out of the folks, you know, the plain folks that yes. you know, gays were gonna be demonstrating sex in the classrooms and that sort of thing. And so unless you give me $20 to you know, elect so-and-so to Congress, yeah. He, he's, he is quite a character. But, but there was this powerful line that you wrote about the direct mail that he used, because he was really strong at using mailing lists as right. ways to raise money. And, and he said, Democrats think of direct mail as fundraising. It's not, it's advertising, it's advertising. And then you wrote, Vigory, explain, Vigory explains that the media is left of center and direct mail is the way to connect directly with voters. It's the only way that the Republic, Republicans feel, this is pre-Fox of course, that right. they can communicate directly. And, and as, I'm, as, as I'm reading this, um, I started to wonder, did he have something there? And was the fact that the new right that mm -hmm. you write about connected directly with voters, almost like some kind of prehistoric social media. Right. The, the, the social media parallels are strong. He also said direct mail is like a water moccasin, silent but deadly. So when everyone wakes up in the morning and realized that, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, Jared Kushner and Steve Bannon had been, you know, and, and, and our friends, you know, uh, and the, the Russian steps are, you know, seeding our social media with these horror stories uh, after the election. That was a lot like what was happening in the 1976 and 1978 election. By the 1980 election, people were pretty getting pretty wise. Now, the question is, what were they feeding kind of directly to the people? I mean, just to, you know, I'm not sure that that Vigory style direct mail was used in the, um, uh, you know, that, that fluoridation campaign. But, you know, if, if it was, it would have said, um, you know, these, 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 these scientists who are elected by nobody claim this, this fluoride is uh, preventing tooth decay, but really we think it causes cancer, mm. right? Uh, or they, you know, just to take a, a real example, um, you know, they would, they would say, uh, yeah, that was, a, that was here, here's, here's, here's a really good example that, that, that um, the IRS, you know, um, is you know increasing the rule you know it has new rules you know for Christian schools to keep their tax exemptions. What they really have in mind is forcing uh, Christian schools to hire homosexual teachers. I mean that's a literal example, right? Uh, and so the idea that there's this kind of almost um, parallel reality that conservatives are fed that 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 you know doesn't you know, comport with the actual reality that we know now on Fox News, uh, that also was a, a process that was a long time coming. And uh, in the case of Richard Vigory's apology uh, that, you know, direct mail is really advertising, a lot of that was um, self-serving. It was to stay one step ahead of the law because, you know, he was charging people exorbitant fees and sometimes he would charge people more than they actually raised in the fundraiser. So he was um, trying to stay, um, uh, uh, Congressman Israel's uh, late colleague, Charlie Wilson, uh, um, decided that he was gonna regulate this stuff. And every not-for-profit group in America was behind it. But then once again, they fired up this kind of propaganda machine and the ministers and said, really what they wanna do is uh, make it impossible for ministers to grow their churches, right? So yeah. that kind of poisoning, that befouling of, of um, the well of information was a huge part about which what Richard Vigory uh, was all about. Uh, you know, also the, the 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 original conservative political action committees, the National Conservative Political Action Committee. Uh, Steve will remember um, Terry Dolan, right? 
who was a new right, the youngest member of the new, new right cohort who started the National Conservative Political Action Committee and began uh, uh, putting up these foul negative advertisements against senators like um, Frank Church and, and, and George McGovern year and a half before they even had any opponents to kind of soften them up for the 1978 and 1980 Senate races. And he said, the great thing about political action committees, in other words, soft money on coordinated campaigns, uh, is that we can lie through our teeth and the candidate we support stays clean. Right. I mean, he, he's, he's bragging about this a lot like Roger Stone kind of brags about, you know, his various exploits. A kind of idea like, like catch me if you can, trolling yes. liberals, dare, dare you to you snowflakes, you know, don't you really want to play the game, right? And now we're seeing it come from the White House. And, and so I'm going to um, hand this over and, and we're going to get questions now um, from the audience. But is it too much? I, it's, I spent a lot of time thinking about that part. Is it too much of an extrapolation for me to make to almost think that that training, that, that the, honing the skill of directly communicating with voters because they couldn't leverage the mainstream media as well. Is, is there a direct line to their use of the conservatives use of social media today? Or is that too long of a, of a line? Oh, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely part of the discourse. But the fact of the matter is the media was bending over backwards to get the conservative message. Uh, you know, into the mainstream media, you know, uh, um, you know, newspapers were hiring people like William Sapphire as their columnist, you know, Nixon's uh, speechwriter. They were, they were, you know, getting the syndicated columns of Patrick Buchanan so they could somehow um, protect themselves from the charge that they were uh, not vessels for liberalism because there was, there existed this then and now, this discourse that, um, Politics is only respectable if you represent both sides, even if one of the sides is, you know, systematically and, and, and admittedly lying. Natalie, as uh, we hand over for a, a moment to the congressman, who I'm sure has uh, no fewer than 27 questions on his mind that he would like to uh, discuss with Rick. Uh, is there any um, instruct? Just two? Okay. Well, you're, you're better. He was giving me the peace symbol. Yeah, I think, yeah. Well, the liberal that you are, he probably is, but uh, or, the, or the Nixon look. One and a half. <laughs> um, Natalie, is there any instruction for uh, the viewers, listeners that you want to give before uh, Congressman Israel takes over? Absolutely. So if anybody has a question, please look at the bottom of your screen and you'll see the raise hand function. If you click on that, it will let us know that you're in queue and then I can call on you after Congressman Israel. Thanks so much. Well, thank you. As Natalie is populating that queue, uh, Rick, uh, half a question and then a, a slightly more abstract question. Uh, I, I hope you're not finished uh, tracing the arcs of history. Um, you know, I would argue that the 1990s when Gingrich uh, changed strategies and tactics in Washington was another extraordinary, uh, a, uh, a macro trend uh, that changed the complexion of politics. Will there be another book? Uh, yes, and it's going to be about the 1830s. Oh. <laughs> uh, then my next, my next adventure is to explain the rise of, uh, of um, markets and industrialism around the world. All so right. I, take on, I take on the big ones. We will look for that. Now, a slightly more abstract question. Um, I've always been fascinated by the strategies, strategies and tactics of the conservative mm -hmm. movement. Uh, contrasted with the strategies and tactics, or lack thereof, of the progressive movement. Right. Um, so your book traces the, the hardball tactics of right. the conservative movement. The flyleaf actually says, traces conservatives' cutthroat strategies to gain power. Uh, and says I'll that, thank my editor for that. Yeah. yeah. And you can also thank your editor for this line, uh, a look at, quote, new right organizers deploying state of the art technologies and bending political norms to the breaking point. Right. Off of that, right now, one could argue that the, well, there's no argument, the Republicans right now are 2-0 and o in denying Democrats a vote uh, for the Supreme right. Court. They've done a triple axle reverse flip uh, on the 2016 right. uh, position. Sometimes it strikes me that conservatives play to win and Democrats play to discuss the rules. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering, is, is that a fair contrast as you- I would, I would just love to turn this, or turn this around and ask how the heck that ends up happening. I mean, when, when, when the Democrats took over the Senate last time, uh, Patrick Leahy, a great champion of human rights and a great Senator in many ways, decided the first thing to do 
was to make a uh, bipartisan buy-in a more important, more, more, more important feature of the nomination and uh, and and seating of members of the federal judiciary. So he made the blue slip slip process easier to use, giving literally the Republicans a veto power over every Democratic judge. When the Republicans get into power, they steal a Supreme Court seat. Uh, the abstract, my abstract answer to that question is that uh, liberals and conservatives have completely opposed definitions of what principle is, right? Mm -hmm. When it comes to liberals, principle means fair procedures, transparency, uh, being nice. Uh, a liberal uh, congressman who has a, a very important vote, the clock is ticking, and he needs to get onto that floor, but he sees a little old lady who needs help across, you know, Pennsylvania Avenue, will take her arm and, and, and take her across the street. A Republican who wants to exercise principle, principle means achieving the ends of getting power, right? A conservative who's not a squish, a conservative who wants respect as a principled conservative will knock her aside and, you know, lower the minimum wage down to eight cents, right? So it's a very different way of looking at the world. Of course, that wasn't always the case. Let me tell you, Franklin Roosevelt was one tough cookie, right? Uh, you know, Phil Burton was one tough guy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Nancy Tip O'Neill knew how to- one tough yeah. woman, right? What's that? Nancy Pelosi is one tough woman. No. 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 She said that we don't, we can't pursue, she didn't want to pursue uh, uh, an impeachment of the president unless both sides agreed that it was likely or possible, right? That yeah. was a surrender that will write her a black mark in history mm. for allowing a dictatorship to come to power in the United States. She, they should have gone after, after this criminal with everything they had. And the fact that she didn't shows the liberal, the liberal ideology at its worst, that fairness, transparency uh, uh, is um, the most important thing and not um, achieving power, in this case, power for the American people to uh, live their lives in freedom and dignity. Well, it's well, going to be tough, but not when it comes to fighting Donald Trump. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, we, we have a bunch of people ready to ask questions, but I would love to further that conversation with you. Will, Wait, when we, when we, when we, when I meet the caucus, we can do that. Yeah, well. We can ask your, your Republican colleagues how tough they think she is. All right, uh, Natalie, shall we go to questions? Absolutely. We have a few people lined up. Uh, the first is former Congressman Jack Kingston. If you could please unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Hey, Jack. Okay, thank It's great to listen to you, Steve. Uh, I think we need to spend more time with each other and cross-pollinate a little. <laughs> um, you're doing a great job on this, and I, I, I appreciate your email the other day. Um, Rick, now I got to talk to you a little bit about being a Republican. I look at Act blue that now has i think closing in on a billion and a half dollars or some astronomical amount and i'm thinking why don't we have that on the good side that is on the republican team um i, I i'm just having I'm, I'm blue with envy of, of act blue and you were talking about um the sophistication it of you know one side versus the other it seems to me that right now the democrats have the technological edge. Certainly they do with something like uh, Act Blue with uh, fundraising. And Steve, you probably were the brainchild behind that when you ran the Congressional Committee. But um, I, I just wanted to uh, get your thoughts on it. Well, when it comes to, you know, seeding secret messages via Facebook using psychographics, you know, where African Americans are, you know, uh, educated that somehow the, the Democratic candidate has doesn't have their interest at heart. I'd say that that's a pretty sophisticated technological setup too, but maybe they had a little help. All right. Great. Our next question comes from Carol Anderson. Carol, if you could unmute yourself, please. Carol, you with us? She's on mute. Yeah. Let's go to the next one. And if we can get Carol back, we will. Absolutely. So the next question comes from Jeremy Paul. Jeremy, if you could unmute yourself, please. I clicked on mute. Can you hear me? We can yeah. hear you, Jeremy. Excellent. So, so Rick, I, I'm delighted to, to see you. It was nice of you to come to Northeastern and speak a couple of years ago for us. Uh, I'm wondering if in your book you cover 
uh, not only Reagan's political rise, uh, but also his time uh, as president. Because one of the things that has always struck me as very odd is the way that the Democrats uh, have allowed the national perception that he was a very successful president, when in fact he did uh, have the good fortune to be there when the um, Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, but at the same time, uh, he basically started the whole chain of deregulation uh, and um, uh, ma massive uh, deficits that ultimately led to the uh, collapse of the ability of the federal government. Well, Jimmy to... Carter started the deregulation. Yeah, he started a little bit, yeah, but, but uh, not- Yeah, I mean, uh, Reagan's presidency, I don't write about. Uh, you know, right. give you the tools to understand it, but um, I think one of the striking things, you know, one, I can just recommend a really good book about, you know, kind of a day-to-day -day coverage of the, the Reagan presidency is um, Triumph of the Imagination by Richard Reeves. And one of the things that really struck me reading that book is, you know, what was going on in Lebanon and, and the giant cock up, uh, you know, the Reagan administration achieved there. And, you know, one of the things, I mean, there was this, you know, weird Rube Goldberg situation involving uh, Lebanon and Iran and Central America. This is, you know, Iran-Contra. When you actually like look at, you know, kind of you, you actually tell it to a young person exactly what this, this was about. So, you know, um, proxies of Iran were taking American hostages in Lebanon and uh, demanding ransom. Uh, we negotiated with them. We told them we'd give you missile parts if you release our hostages. They got the, 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 you know, the money from uh, uh, the, 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 they took the, the profits from the missile parts and gave it to uh, these uh, right-wing death squads in Central America after Congress banned, uh, you know, banned America from giving them any money, uh, uh, just a black letter violation of a law passed by Congress. And then Lebanon would release the hostages and then they'd take more. I mean, that's literally what happened. Uh, not only negotiating with terrorists, but unsuccessfully negotiating terrorists and using the profits to break the law. This is a great president. I, 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 I don't, I was just a teenager then, you know, don't look at me. But uh, I think a lot of this is, um, you know, the media's desperation to appear fair by being, you know, to, 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 by treating Reagan as a, a great book about the media and the Reagan presidency called it On Bended Knee. I think there was a lot of sympathy for him uh, after the assassination attempt. And I think one of the striking things about Reagan and the presidency is Jimmy Carter's, one of the reasons Jimmy Carter's presidency failed, and I think uh, the congressman will probably just will probably agree with me, is that he had his finger in every pie. He was a micromanager. And people were terrified, you know. Well, you know, 80, you know, people, one of the reasons, um, I, I found this very strange, uh, unexpected fact in the exit polls in the 1980 elections that people who thought the hostage crisis was the most important issue voted for Carter by a, by a ratio of two to one which is completely the opposite of what people assume. I think the reason people was people were so terrified that, that Reagan was gonna nuke Iran. People were terrified that Reagan would be a complete, you know, doddering failure as president. But the fact that he was so hands off and kind of let his aides take care of things and delegated so much is actually a pretty good way to be president. So I think the shock that the world didn't fall apart, you know, in Ronald Reagan's first months and years kind of gave him a, a little bit more of a pass among um, uh, the media than he would have had otherwise. Great. Carol, were you able to unmute? No. So we'll go to Richard Cohen. Richard, if you could please unmute yourself. Is that the call, Mr. Stone? Wonder. Richard? Can you hear me? Which I can Richard? hear you, Richard. How are you? Okay, I'm, I'm Richard Cohen. I'm a senator from Minnesota. I'm not the columnist. Uh, sorry. Um, so, so if I can ask the question, um, and I've, I've only, I've read the first three books, haven't, I'm only about page 30 of the fourth. I'm honored, um, thank you. Was, was there any sense back 40 years ago as to where demographics were going in the country? We're now, you know, as a Democrat, we think demographics are destiny. Was right. there any sense on the part yeah. of conservatives, and I have some questions about that, any, any yeah. part of the sense of conservatives 40 years ago, right. is this gonna be the same country down the road? No, no, and immigration really was not much of an issue in the 1980 election. I mentioned that, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan said very kind things about uh, undocumented immigrants in the Texas primary. He kind of reversed himself and kind of fudged it and probably, you know, he had some very good pollsters, uh, but there was very little discussion of America becoming, uh, you know, less white at that particular time. I can say more about, you know, I can go a little bit more to the abstractions of history. I reject, um, 
the idea that somehow America is going to become majority minority and that sort of provides some sort of uh, guaranteed success for the Democrats for two reasons. Uh, first of all, the category of who gets to be counted as white in America is consistently shifted. There's a book called How the Irish Became White, right? They were considered racial others when they first came here. So, you know, if, if Hispanic Americans, you know, manage to kind of work their way into, you know, white identity, uh, then all bets are off on that one. They become one more of the, le uh, the repeated uh, history of immigrant groups rising through America's class system and then pulling down the ladder for the next group. Um, of course, African Americans have always unfortunately been um, excluded from that process. They're always uh, tragically being, you know, kind of counted as the mud sill of society. Hey, Senator, don't go away. I, I, Rick, if, if you're okay with this, sure. I've got to ask the Senator, you're a Senator in the St. Paul area. Minnesota is a must win state for Joe Biden. The Trump campaign thinks they can make a run at it. Who wins Minnesota? I want the on the ground report. Um, historically, I tend to be pretty realistic about stuff. I think Biden wins, and it's not close. The, all the polling suggests uh, Biden's up. Uh, our Senate caucus polling suggests that uh, Biden is up significantly in suburban Minnesota. So, And Congressman think, and Senator, if, if I could um, make uh, the point I always make when I'm asked about the electoral, electoral, electoral questions about this election, uh, it is a profound mistake to look at this election only in terms of who gets the most votes, whether they're popular votes or electoral votes. Uh, the, Ronald, uh, D Donald Trump does not see this as an election. He sees this as an attempt to regain power, probably because if he loses power, he has a chance of, of going to jail. And the people around him feel fear that they might go to jail. And uh, the public officials in the Republican Party fear the judgment of history should uh, they be revealed for what they are. So uh, hopefully the person who gets the most votes will win, uh, but unfortunately that's in the air right now. And we have to see this election as not just the question of who gets the most more. So of course we need, uh, speaking as a partisan Democrat, we need a commanding popular victory and electoral vote victory, but we also have to be ready for um, the kind of tragedies we've only seen in other continents in other centuries. Natalie, can we take uh, one more question? Yeah, so Carol was able to put her question in the chat. She asks, can you make a digest and get your key point, a 30-year conspiracy to establish minority rule, out to the general public? Can I? Yes. My 30-year my 30 plan to, to, oh, if I were to, uh, if I were to, well, I, I, I would, I would um, support the idea that every uh, a patriotic American should be armed and that they should be armed to fight tyranny on the part of their government. And lo and behold, that's exactly what we've heard from the last 30 years from my friends on the other side of the aisle. All right. All right. Uh, Chris, you go. Chris, you want to uh, have a few concluding words and then I'll wrap it up. Is that okay? That, that's, yeah, that, that's terrific. Thank you. Um, I, so I have two follow-ups based on what you just said. Um, one, at the beginning, you said to me that yes, you thought Reagan would recognize the Republican yes. Party today. You also, in Congressman Israel's question about Nancy Pelosi, said that the current president is a dictator and a criminal. Why would, would Reagan caucus? He, would, would he caucus <laughs> with this party? Uh, when um, when um, Spiro Agnew, the vice president of the United States, uh, um, pleaded guilty, no look contendory, I should say, to fraud that involved literally taking money in envelopes from people in the vice presidential office and in his office as governor, Ronald Reagan refused to denounce him because Reagan saw the world in terms of good guys and bad guys, and Ted Agnew was one of the good guys. And when Michael Deaver, you can read this in his memoir, um, said, Governor, uh, you, you, you can't hold on to, 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 your, to your friendship with Ted Agnew. This guy, this guy is an admitted crook. He said Ronald Reagan got madder at him than he'd ever seen and throw his keys at him. So if Donald Trump, uh, if Ronald Reagan should, decide, should have decided that Ronald Reagan was on the side of right, I mean, that, that Donald Trump was on the side of right, it would be very hard for him to kind of change his mind in the facts of the evidence, in the face of the evidence. And my last question is, uh, you, you were just talking with the senator from Minnesota um, in, 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 uh, about this outcome. Mm -hmm. One of the things you write about in the book is 
um, the sense that the DNA, the, the belief that the DNA of America, you, you wrote, oh no, no, this was in an essay that you wrote um, in these times. You wrote an essay uh, about uh, museums and, and right. the, the Americans' desire to you know, not confront reality, but to, to come together, right. um, which you kind of argue is not a way to get to an end. My, my, my question is, if Biden is running as, as the, right. you know, with the idea that we should be coming together, that, that part of the DNA, but the reality is what we're seeing, what you just said, that this is not a normal election, this is about a, a race for power, is the theme of right. trying to promote that DNA of Americans to want to come together, is that just the wrong theme at this time? You know, it's working. I think in a lot of ways and people, the fact is he is appealing to an electorate that wants to believe in you know, uh, un unity and the idea that America is a, a country that's fundamentally decent. Um, I think that Biden is pretty sophisticated in seeing himself and sophisticated and mature and kind of admirable in seeing himself as a transitional figure. You know, he knows he is uh, um, opening the door for a new generation of Democrats. They'll probably think about the world in a very different way. I think for America to kind of transcend its wounds, it needs the sort of thing that we saw in South Africa, a Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission, which required the malefactors in South Africa in order to receive grace for their, for their crimes and their sins to admit them, right? But that's a very ugly and difficult process, and it's not going to happen overnight. Well, Rick, thank you. Steve, I will uh, turn it over to you for uh, your, your closing words, but um, Rick, you, you describe yourself as a historian um, and then author of uh, these various books. Um, I don't know which one I would put first for you, Citizen. historian or author. Um, Citizen. Say it again. Citizen. 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 Okay, Citizen. fine. We'll call you Citizen, but uh, thank you. The books are just all um, wonderful reads, uh, the, the prose and the history. Thank you. My friends, uh, before you go, Rick, uh, let me remind uh, our friends next Wednesday at 1 p.m., Anatomy of an Ad, you're going to learn everything you need to know about how political ads are constructed, produced, and presented. And then on October 1st at 11 a.m., Jeffrey Tubin talking about something that Rick Perlstein alluded to, and that is what happens in this country, not on election day, but the day after the election. Yes. If you've not read this book yet, get it. It is just extraordinary and entertaining. And Rick Perlstein, thank you for being a chronicler of the conservative movement and the 1830s we've just learned. <laughs> thank uh, you, Congressman. Thank I you. look forward to our next meeting. I can't wait. Uh, thank you all very much. Stay uh, healthy and safe. And with that, we will say farewell. Thank you, everybody.